Good evening. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order and thank you all for coming. Um, I'd like to rise to say the Pledge of the Flag. And Curtis, will you lead us in the Pledge of the I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, this has been a really tough uh, few weeks for the town of Stanford. Um, we've lost three Stanford residents. I think it was last month that John Battistoni passed. And I just found out yesterday that Karen Quinn had passed, um, which was shocking to me. I'm sure it was shocking to all of us. Um, I haven't spoken with John Quinn yet, um, but I'm hoping to have his permission to dedicate the May meeting to Karen and uh, get maybe get Charlie Shaw to do the dedication. Um, but tonight, we're dedicating the meeting to Sean McCarthy. And um, it's obvious by the fact that three flags are lowered in this town that Sean was incredibly beloved. And I am going to turn this meeting over to Ed Sorrell um, for the dedication. Um, and, and could you go oh, up sure. to the, thank you, to Captain, Chief, Ed Chief, Chief this time. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Ed Searle. I'm the current Chief at Stanford Fire Company. Um, I've been serving there for about 16 years. Um, I'd just like to take a couple minutes to talk about Sean McCarthy. Um, he set the gold standard for what it means to be um, a member of this community, to be a citizen, and to serve the people around him. I'm sure almost all of you must know him, um, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you stuff you probably already know about him. Um, besides running the pharmacy in town, I keep hearing these stories about how instead of just sending someone to deliver uh, prescriptions, Sean would go himself. Um, comfort parents with a crying baby, um, help them along, and, and you know, show how much he actually cared about them as individuals and about their families and about the people in this community. Um, besides all the work he did, as if that wasn't enough, um, he was a member of Stanford Fire Company. This would have been his 35th year. He was an emergency medical technician. He was an <coughs> interior firefighter. Um, he served as our company president. He served as a treasurer. He was a grant writer. He served on committees for fundraisers over and over again. Um, he gave his time for the people in this community. Um, and we're gonna miss him terribly, but at the same time, having someone like that um, to work with on a regular basis um, builds you up. He, I remember when I first joined the company, and I was this complete novice poser who didn't understand what he was doing. And it was, it's embarrassing and it's, it's humbling. And uh, Sean pulled me aside after, after a car accident we had helped clean up. And, and he said, thank you for being here, really appreciate it. And I thought, I kind of looked around and he was looking at me and talking to me. And um, even in his position of great service and love for his community. He went around and built up the next person to do the same thing. Um, so that's the kind of legacy that he leaves behind. And I, I hope everybody remembers him that way. Um, his memorial is going to be on Saturday. So and it's, we're going to have a gathering at the firehouse. So thank you so much for listening. And uh, remember our brother. Wendy Burton? Here. Julie Dakota? Here. Eric Ames? Present. Nathan LaVirtue absent. And Teddy Secor? Here. I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda um, with the addition 
um, resolution for a second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 So, um, town board liaison reports. Teddy? Yes. Uh, so the ZBA did not meet this month, so hopefully next month they will be meeting. Uh, the Climate Smart Communities Task Force had a meeting several weeks ago, uh, kind of as a reformation meeting. Uh, our last chair was, is busy enough that he could not continue the responsibility of chairs, so he is still part of the committee, but I have instead taken that position on. We are going to discuss going forward the composting program that I mentioned last uh, meeting, and we're going to hopefully next month have a presentation during the town board meeting on the greenhouse gas inventory that the former chair, Nate Kimball, uh, did. So we will have more information on that as we go along. Okay. Uh, for <clears throat> the planning board, I attended a meeting on March 21st. There was one item of business uh, it involved a major subdivision and conservation density final plat for the property located at 6909 Route 82 in Stanfordville. Uh, this parcel has a total of 225.2 acres uh, with a, uh, it's gonna be a four uh, residential lots with a private road and 113.12 acres are gonna be uh, restricted open space uh, based on a conservation easement. Uh, there was a seven page resolution that Sarah Knickerbocker beautifully read into the record and the resolution passed uh, unanimously. Thank you. You're welcome. Julia. These, <clears throat> the CAC did not meet last week, uh, last um, session, but Curtis will be here tonight talking about the roadside cleanup, which I um, hope to see everybody there. Um, previously um, in the meeting, and I don't know if it was covered because I was um, absent in March, but the, um, the previous meeting to that, um, we discussed the natural resources inventory and the status of that document. Um, and it's um, aimed completion date by end of year 2024. Um, for the rec, um, for those of you that don't know, the playground is being built next week. Um, so good timing on the town board meeting. Um, we are in really, really, really excellent shape in terms of preparation. Uh, following the $500,000 purchase of materials and equipment, um, the committee that was formed then went out to um, recruit volunteers. Um, that volunteer labor is worth the equivalent of $1 million in the state of New York, and that will be applicable for grant um, reimbursement as well as the materials and tools, uh, materials and supplies. Um, we've also gotten um, food donations across the entire uh, 22 meal time period, those eight days from local businesses. Um, we've recruited 200 volunteers to join us. We need more, um, especially in the second phase, which is April 30th, May 1st, May 2nd, May 3rd, and May 4th, a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, our volunteer committee it will be recruiting residents this weekend, um, as well as actively um, uh, recruiting in the next few days. And um, the tools committee will be collecting tools this weekend, um, loaned from um, various um, residents locally. We're nearly there in terms of um, tool donations as well but we were very heartened to be awarded a $10,000 grant from Home Depot <coughs> recently where um, we can go and shop for tools should we not have everything donated to us. Um, we were also donated the use of heavy equipment from local business owners um, like Halton and um, uh, Rath Ben Rathjen offered uh, his front loader to us and the use of his crew um, in spreading mulch. Um, many local business owners um, have uh, chipped in when all said and done, the project will be the equivalent of $2 million, um, which is incredible in this day and age that our community could fundraise and um, put that together and execute on it. Um, and I think that's, oh, if you want to, the only thing that's outstanding are snacks and drinks and supplies for the kids. Um, so um, you can take a look at the website uh, on the flyer there. And um, 
uh, find information on how to support the build if you can't be there to build or, um, or, or donate funds. There's something for everybody to do. Um, it's extremely humbling to be a part of this process. Um, and I feel very honored. Well, I, frankly, I don't, you, you've been utterly indispensable to the project. So we're honored to have you, truly. Um, my report, my bank reconciliation was sent out, my supervisor's report and bank reconciliation was accomplished in record time. It's the first time I did the whole bank reconciliation without one mistake to track down, and that was satisfied. Um, and I've distributed two payroll verification sheets. Um, my fire commission liaison report, Greg Sarzak was appointed to the open position of the fifth commissioner, because um, Dennis Duhal had to step down due to his judgeship. Um, so the fire, the fire commissioners voted to invest certain funds into the New York class uh, structure which I actually had been uh, advocating for several years uh, so they can be getting a better return on their investments and they're um, actively doing that right now, which is great. And their annual physicals are play taking place next week. My zoning commission report, five members of the county planning department came and spoke to us about ways to increase the number of affordable homes in Dutchess, not in Dutchess, in Stanford. Um, which we all know is a huge challenge, particularly because we do not have central sewer or water. We're hoping to hear more about viable alternatives in septic systems um, from the county this month, because septics is really the big holdup. Um, and the commission may be moving forward towards offering housing relief very shor uh, shortly. <coughs> Swap shed, I'm pursuing the possibility of having a swap shed um, at the transfer station. Um, we had one in Red Hook and it was really wonderful. Um, I'm talking to Bay Horse um, and they're um, going to give us a discount and they're going to deliver it for free as long as we prepare the pad. So I think that will move forward. Um, I'm, I'm working with the transfer station guys to for the specs on the shed. Um, HVAC system, you'll see later in the, in the agenda. We um, are going to reject the one bid that we got. Um, there was a problem with it, tying into um, the warranty being dependent on, our on the company pro also providing the propane that runs the generator. <laughs> And there are two, they were, we explained very carefully, it was two separate issues, so we're going to reject that bid and we're putting it out for bid again. And our hope really has always been that local contractors um, will, will bid the job and that we'll be able to award it to one of our own, but we'll, we'll see. We've, have we put that bid out in the paper? Or It'll we, be in Sunday's paper. Terrific, thank you, Rita. Uh, farmer's Market. The opening day will be May 18th, and the hours will be from 8 to 2. Um, they were going to open earlier, but they didn't want to get in the way of the build of the playground, so it's happening May 18th. My favorite topic, the bridge closures. <laughs> I'm cautiously optimistic that Huns Lake Bridge will open next week. Yay. Cautiously <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> Um, we've been in touch with the county about the lack of detour signs, the poor placement of detour signs for Route 17, the Salt Point Bridge closures. Um, they promised to take action this week, um, and I, I know that they made some adjustments, but they also told me um, that if they're, they're ordering new signs, um, it may take several weeks to get everything in place. My hope is that soon, all of us who drive those routes will know what not to do. Um, that, you know, I think it takes a little time for everybody to just go, oh, right, I can't go down Salt Point, and the bridge is closed in both directions. But I'm also hoping that the county will do a, a much better job in, in signing the detours. Because even today, when I came 
back down Jameson to Route 82 coming from the south into town, there's no sign at 17 that says don't turn here. You know, I mean, you could turn there if you wanted to go to Gary Lovett Preserve, but they sh it should be noted in both directions. So they still have work to do. Um, we know the traffic is heavy now on Jamison Hill, Haight Hill Market. We're working with our speed signs and hopefully um, with others from the Sheriff Department, um, which Carl Merritt is arranging um, to try to slow the speeding down, the continuing saga. Um, for Veterans Affairs, we're beginning the process of becoming, or hopefully becoming, a Purple Heart town. And um, we have a guest speaker tonight from Pleasant Valley, who Pleasant Valley has become a Pleasant, a pleasant Heart town, a Purple Heart <laughs> town. Um, so we're working, I, I did some work with the National Purple Heart Museum to get the names of Stanford's living and deceased Purple Hearts recipients, and they have, they have none of our people in their records. They have a tiny percentage of Purple Heart recipients, and none of our people actually have registered there. So it would be extremely helpful for anyone in Stanford who knows of a Purple Heart recipient or is a Purple Heart recipient to send Rita their name, because um, right now we only know of two. Uh, there are many details to work through, including funding opportunities, but we've begun the process and we're quite excited about um, another way to honor our veterans. Um, and I would like to point out the beautiful and ancient maps that are now hanging. Those are on loan from the Stanford Historical Society. They're really um, fun to look at, but Kathy asks that we don't touch them <laughs> because they're fragile. Um, and so I want to thank her for that. And I think, I hope, that's the end of my report. <laughs> oh, one thing, uh, one other thing is that we're going to, we are going to purchase a generator for the cell tower. Um, it's taken th over three years and uh, it hadn't happened, so I brought that activity in house and we have located the generator that we want. Now we're looking for electricians who can, an electrician who can set it up so that if there's a power outage, um, the, uh, the cell tower w will have a generator backup and the fire, the, the fire people, firemen and women will be able to talk to each other and to the highway crew. So that's in process too. So with that, um, Mary Beth, would you like to like talk and get this over with or should we have privilege of the floor and then we'll, do, are you okay sitting there for, okay. All right, then I'd like to open the floor to privilege of the floor. Um, please state your name and address for Rita Mary. Please come to the podium um, to speak about a town matter and, um, that's all I've got to say. Oh, that's what I have for today. Yes, Eddie, could you? Yes. Thank you. Am I good to go? Yeah. Cool. Uh, good evening. I'm Travis Christian uh, from 166 Charwell Drive. As I stated last month, I'm one of the petitioners in the Article 78 against the ZBA and my neighbor at 158 Charwell Drive. The Supreme Court annulled part of the ZBA's ruling and remitted a determination around the declared accessory use in this ruling. In case it makes its way back to the ZBA, I want to make the term accessory use and its applicability to Rathjen's landscaping business operating at 158 Charwell Drive abundantly clear. This is especially important since in previous town meetings, ZBA members have made erroneous statements about town code and have said they're unclear with some code interpretation. I would like to ensure that this statement is heard by the ZBA and the board and the townsfolk before any discussion is had so there can be no claim of <coughs> ambiguity. Unequivocally, Rathjen's landscaping operating at 158 Charwell Drive does not meet the criteria for accessory use. It is definitively primary use. Accessory use, as defined in the town code, is a use that is incidental and subordinate to the primary use. Incidental and subordinate is defined as incidental, meaning 
uh, meaning <clears throat> minor in nature and occurs as natural, albeit less significant, part of the primary use. And subordinate means the use does not dominate in terms of space, function, or purpose. When combined, they mean that the activity or structure in question must be relating to or stemming from the primary use in a minor or supporting role and does not change the property's primary character. Examples of this include a, a garage for a home, storage sheds, or a small in-home office. Given the level of activity from Rastian's landscaping, including but not limited to parking for four plus employees, coming and going of three to four large commercial trucks daily, weekly delivery of raw landscaping materials from tractor trailers and dump trucks, and routine running of construction equipment to move those raw materials and load them in those trucks, it is clear that the activity levels, noise, domination of the space, and alteration of the environment and character of the property, and thereby my property since I'm a neighbor, is far greater than the primary single family use of that property. It would be egregious for a ruling to determine that Rathjen's landscaping business at 158 Charwell Drive is an accessory use and therefore the use should not be allowed since two primary uses, which it is a primary use, are prohibited in residential zones. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Travis, can I copy that? Yes. Thanks. Thank you so much. Is anyone else? Claudia DeBellis. I'd just like to speak in support of Travis. The trucks remain fast and dangerous. Uh, last week I was almost pushed off the road by one. Um, it's a good thing I just moved over quickly. Claudia, what's your address? Uh, 265 Charwell. And I am also uh, a member of that case, and w which was very difficult to join because I have never in my life been part of something against a neighbor, and it went down hard. But the danger and the noise, the noise, I can't imagine being right next to it. But almost getting wiped out by one of those dump trucks was horrifying. Thank you, Claudia. Okay, then. Um, I have a letter um, that was sent in by um, Betty Cosgrove. And um, Julia, will you read this sure. into the record, please? There is a town board meeting tonight, and I cannot attend as I am out of town. I ask that you read and submit this letter on my behalf. I and 20 plus members of the Charwell Fancor neighborhood demand an immediate resolution by shutting down the unapproved operation of Rathjen's landscaping on Charwell Drive. First, the community needs to be aware that town money in the sum of $35,000 was spent on the ineffective ZBA defense from a lawsuit that they did not need to defend to allow a nursery to operate in an RR5 zone. And to note that their very own ZBA member is also the actual nursery owner and co-defendant in this case. Second, this alleged nursery, which is owned by a ZBA member who directly benefits financially, calling his business a nursery when in actuality he operates primarily as a landscaping business. The court has officially declared that any landscaping business is not within the purview of being a nursery. Hence, this ZBA member has been operating a third unapproved use of land, which is the main contention all along by the neighbors of Charwell. Third, the town board would be advised to take ethical action and clean house to remove ZBA members who personally profit when seeking to find an angle, calling the business a nursery into the zoning laws. Also, you should consider removal for ethical reasons of any ZBA members who supported, in effect, unnecessarily their fellow ZBA member by using $35,000 of the town's money for expensive lawyering, which resulted in a negative outcome for both of them. The RR5 laws were set up to protect the rights and the harmony of residential homeowners and not for the enrichment or profits of ZBA members or their own commercial interests. 
Many Charwell neighbors bought their homes over 30 years ago in a residential RR5 protected zone, thinking they wouldn't have to deal with commercial entities pe perpetrating a disturbance. And they expected the ZBA to protect them. Disturbing issues such as excess noise, expensive and large commercial equipment, traffic, 18-wheel truck deliveries, salt, stockpiles, chemicals, and pollution. The community relied on the RR5 zoning laws to protect and secure their property values, safe roads, neighborly harmony, and uncontaminated well water for future generations. I asked the town board to do the right thing and have zoning enforcement shut down this landscaping operation and to consider finding ZBA members who promise to preserve residential neighborhoods from commercial operations and who will judiciously conserve town money. Thank you, Betty Cosgrove. Is there anyone else? Then I move to close privilege of the floor. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 New business, um, I make a motion to appoint Jean Walsh um, as the new bookkeeper to the secretary, uh, to the supervisor. Holy crow. Uh, second. Are there any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now, the moment we've been waiting for, <laughs> we are very honored to have Mary Beth Muir. Muir? Yes. Uh, who is the uh, sister town clerk over in Pleasant Valley um, and a dear friend of Rita Mary's, uh, making a presentation on their towns becoming a Purple Heart town. And I would like to add, on um, Tuesday, the Dutchess County town clerks, Mary Beth hosted us and gave this fantastic example of her wonderful town as a Purple Heart community. So I yeah. asked if she Thank could come you. and do it to us. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to Supervisor Burton, the town board, and to my friend and town Mary for inviting me to speak tonight. I am humbled by this opportunity to speak in front of all of you. For those who do not know me, my name is Mary Beth Muir, and I am the town clerk for the town of Pleasant Valley. I am also one of the founding members of our Hometown Heroes Banner Committee. I had the honor and privilege of hosting my first town clerk luncheon this past Tuesday, and the topic of discussion was honoring our hometown heroes Purple Heart recipients. So what is a Purple Heart recipient? His name is William A. Fox, and his rank was first lieutenant. His unit was Company K, 120th Infantry Division, 30th Infantry Status, Wounded in Action. William A. Fox was one of 136 local veterans of World War I mm. who was awarded his Purple Heart at a special ceremony that took place on May 28, 1932. The Temple Hill Day program was held on the grounds of what is now the home of the National Purple Heart Hall of Honor and New Windsor Canamint. First Lieutenant Fox was severely wounded in action on September 29, 1918. Mm. He was born on the 31st of January in 1895 and passed away on the 1st of October in 1959 at the age of 64. With honor, he lies in rest in our Pleasant Valley Cemetery, Section 12, Single Grave, Number 51. So people ask, what does the Purple Heart mean? The Purple Heart is one of the oldest military decorations still in present use and was initially created by George Washington in 1782 as the Badge of Military Merit. The Purple Heart was the first American service award made available to the common soldier and is awarded to any members of the armed forces of the U.S. who are wounded by an instrument of war in the hands of the enemy and posthumously to the next of kin in the name of those who are killed in action or die of wounds received in action. The heritage it represents is sacred to those who understand the price paid to wear it. The mission of the Military Order of the Purple Heart is to support combat wounded veterans and works to ensure Americans never forget the sacrifices, bravery, and courage made by the US military personnel. So how did this idea come about? <coughs> So in June of 2022, while traveling up to East Ham, Massachusetts on Cape Cod for the sudden passing of my brother-in-law, Matthew, my husband and I, Larry, um, and I entered the, 
entered the town he lived in and noticed a small sign in front of his town hall that said, this is a Purple Heart town. I was very curious what this meant, so I began my homework researching the meaning of a Purple Heart town. The more I researched, the more the project intrigued me. I thought, what a wonderful way to honor our hometown Purple Heart recipients with recognition for their valor, heart, fearlessness, and guts. I brought this attention to my Hometown Heroes Banner Committee members, Jeff, Tony, and Lisa, and with their never-ending support of our military, they loved the idea and could not wait to bring it to the town. As the planning stages began, the committee heard about the Dutchess County Veterans Microgrant. These microgrants offer a one-time grant to local nonprofit veteran organizations and municipalities to enhance activities and programming that address veterans' needs or recognize their service. We thought, what a great opportunity to apply and to use these grant funds to formally recognize Purple Heart recipients in our town by establishing posted signage at the main roads, main entry roads, adding purple lighting to the mill site, post Purple Heart flags at two ends of the mill site and town hall, along with two plaques, a written proclamation stating Pleasant Valley is now a Purple Heart town, and mailing out postcards to the residents for notifications of the honor. I, along with the committee, are happy to say we received a $15,000 grant for our town. Along with the planning of the dedication ceremony, the committee, is, the committee is also looking into naming key sites in town after our Purple Heart recipients. As an example, the bridge on Main Street is going to be called John Doe's Memorial Bridge, and it will have the Purple Heart symbol. Um, the trails at our Bower Park are going to be named after Purple Heart recipients. Please stay tuned for more details. We're working on that. Unfortunately, I could stand here all night telling the stories of so many heroes. But I would like to mention a few recipients of the Purple Heart, some of who you will recognize their names. NFL Pat Tillman played with the Arizona Cardinals from 1998 until May 20, 2002, when he quit the league to join the U.S. Army. He was a member of the 75th Ranger Regiment nine months after September 11, 2001. After turning down a $3.6 million contract, he was deployed to Afghanistan where he was killed in a friendly fire incident. John F. Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy, is the only president to have received a Purple Heart. He received the Navy's highest honors after bravely contributing as gunboat pilot during World War II, PT-109. While volunteering for a motorized torpedo boat duty, the Japanese attacked Kennedy's boat, plunging many of his shipmates overboard into a seat of burning oil. Mm -hmm. Kennedy dove into the waters and rescued three of his fellow shipmates and swallowed some of the water. The future president would later blame the incident for his lifelong stomach problems. John McCain. The military re record of the Arizona Senator John McCain has been widely revered. While serving in Vietnam War with the Navy, the former presidential hopeful received the Silver Star two Legions of Merit, the Distinguished Flying Cross, three Bronze Star Medals, two Navy and Marine Corps Accommodation Medals, the Prisoner of War Medal, and two Purple Hearts. In 1967, McCain, McCain, <coughs> sorry, McCain was captured by the North Vietnamese and was held a prisoner of war until 1973. He returned home with serious, lifelong physical disabilities as a result of his time served. Audie Murphy received, one of the <clears throat> received every one of the Army's combat awards for valor, including the Medal of Honor for single-handedly holding off an entire company of German soldiers in France and then spearheading a successful counterattack. Mm -hmm. He received three Purple Hearts during his time of service after the war. Murphy went on to become a very successful actor starring in more than 40 feature films until he died in a plane crash in 1971. George S. Patton. Unsurprisingly, old blood and guts, General George S. Patton earned a Purple Heart after the establishment of the medal for sustaining combat wounds during World War I. 
the highly decorated soldier went on to command the U.S. 7th Army and the U.S. 3rd Army in World War II, earning recognition and fame for his critical leadership style and colorful personality. He died in a, in a car accident shortly after the end of World War II. One more. <laughs> Colin Powell, former Secretary of State and Army four-star General Colin Powell, earned many medals, ribbons, and foreign decorations during his lengthy military career. Powell served in Vietnam, where he was awarded a Purple Heart following his first combat tour. When his command helicopter crashed, Powell rescued several of his comrades from the flames, including World War II Medal of Honor recipient Jack Treadwell. The rescue earned Powell the Soldier's Medal for heroism, not involving actual conflict with an enemy. As we honor our Pleasant Valley Hometown Heroes Purple Heart recipients, we remember some of those who have lost their lives. Some were injured and returned home, and some that returned have since passed. Though, <clears throat> through all American military, though all American military service members are heroes who sacrifice plenty to help preserve this great nation, Purple Heart recipients have given a little more of themselves while serving with their comrades in arms defending America against all enemies of freedom and liberty. This takes bravery, bravery and loyalty to serve in combat, and these Americans demonstrated plenty. I have a great admiration for our country's military and the sacrifices that these men and women make along with their families. The family plays an important supporting role in knowing their loved one's life could be on the line every day. As the youngest sister of five brothers, my brother Kevin is a veteran of the United States Air Force. After leaving the service, Kevin became a SWAT officer in Aurora, Colorado. One night, going into a drug raid into the Rocky Mountains, Kevin and his po partner were both shot in the line of duty. Thankfully, both of them survived, but are living with the lifelong wounds of the buckshot remaining in their bodies. Kevin, along with his partner, both received the Medal of Honor and Purple Hearts. This goes to show the Purple Heart is acknowledged and given to not only the military, but to first responders as well. Our debt to the heroic men and women in the service <clears throat> of our country can never be repaid. They have earned our undying gratitude. America will never forget their sacrifices. This project has been very close to my heart for the last year and a half. Please remember, the value of the Purple Heart is immeasurable. A person awarded a Purple Heart is a true American hero. And there is a saying from Calvin Coolidge, no person was ever honored for what he received. Honor, was give, honor had been the reward for what he gave. Our, to all the Purple Heart recipients, you inspire the world with your courage. And as the saying goes, the Purple Heart is available to all, but desired by none. <laughs> Purple Heart Day is observed on August 7th each year. Please remember the value of the Purple Heart is immeasurable. These heroes who have served and who have sacrificed should never be forgotten. Thank you. So I just brought an example um, these are our bigger signs. These are going to be at the four main entrances going into our town. Our highway super is going to put them up. <coughs> so, um, and I also brought my Purple Heart Proclamation, if anybody would like to read it. Oh. And during the, ceremony, <coughs> during the ceremony, we had families there of the Purple Heart recipients and we gave each family a Purple Heart coin, challenge coin. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many, how many Purple Heart towns are there? One. In the country? In uh, Dutchess County, okay. there was only one, the town of Beekman. Oh, wow. Okay. And it was many years ago, many years. Matter of fact, they didn't even, like, remember they were a Purple Heart town. Mm -hmm. So now yeah. there's two. So now there's two, mm -hmm. yes. We're going to be three. Yes. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Mary? 
Thank you so much. No, oh, you've Barbara, is there anything the community can do to assist in this endeavor? Well, that's what I was speaking with uh, Wendy and Rita Mary about. You really got to go back to your hometown Hero Banners, and that's where you need to start to look, yeah. to research. Well, we were seeing a lot. We had a lot of uh, our recipients had double Purple Hearts, and it was just truly amazing. But it wasn't until I, we actually saw that sign I didn't know what it meant. Mm. We, we were like, what is that? Yeah. You know, and this was in Massachusetts, so, and then we just went with it, and very proud. If anyone stops by our mill site in town, uh, there's a dedication to the Purple Heart. We have a bronze, uh, excuse me, a brass plaque there um, with a custom-made flag, mm. um, and it says, Our Purple Heart Town, in dedication to the service members of the town of Pleasant Valley, we place this plaque at this memorial site to recognize these service members for their sacrifices, bravery, and courage for our community and country, October 2023. And we also have a plaque now in front of Town Hall Barbara, with a Purple I, Heart flag. I think right now we're, we're asking people's help just to help you to identify. To, yeah, that's where you have to start to recognize. And we will, mm -hmm. we'll reach out to Kathy and, and Louise mm -hmm. on, um, our, our military banner mm -hmm. um, I was so psyched after Mary Beth gave that presentation Tuesday I came back and said when did we have to do this <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I did bring a copy of the proclamation I wrote mm. so if you if you all would like a copy thank you we know two already oh, you, you do know two okay. yeah, maybe three. Oh, is that right who's the third that's great you know Miller Oh, right, right, right. Okay, Thank so we you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I have one, but I think Gloria wanted to ask a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Gloria, did you want to say something? I wanted to ask. You said something about you're supposed to register your Purple Heart? Yes. Usually the families will have it registered. Oh, yes. So to be nationally recognized, it's the museum. My husband, Jim, of course, Jim is a Purple Heart. You could go right online. To the Purple Heart Museum. Can we yeah. just have one conversation, please? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, no, you. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. You can uh, register right online. Yeah. And we have applications out in the hallway and in on mm -hmm. Rita's desk if, if someone wants to register. And you, you, also, you will also come across uh, families, and uh, we have one living recipient. Mm. And uh, during, uh, he was supposed to speak at our ceremony, and he changed his mind at the very last minute. And he had his priest speak. So it's not easy mm -hmm. for these veterans to speak. Sure. Some of them do not want to be recognized yeah. or to speak. Mm -hmm. So we are very respectful of that. Um, he did raise our flag at the ceremony, but he, mm -hmm. he backed out. He, he didn't want, so we did not push him, but we do respect their wishes, yeah, but even though the families of the deceased, we gave them challenge coin. Okay, thank, thank you, you so again, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I do have just a little something for the board, but Rita can hand it up later. Oh my God! As if we could like you even more. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Mary. Right. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Curtis, this is going to be a hard act to follow. I was like, Curtis, did you bring us something? <laughs> Larry, thank you. Just kidding. Sue, thank you. You're thank you. Oh, wonderful. Everybody, this is my husband, Larry. <laughs> Larry. And my Larry. best friend, Sue. Hi, Larry. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank 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 you. That, that will be a tough act to follow. Yeah. <laughs> no. Mary Beth, that was wonderful. Thank you. Really Thank wonderful you. and touching. So, on to something much more mundane: <laughs> <laughs> cleaning up roadside trash. <laughs> so, I'm Curtis DeVito, and I'm vice chairperson of the Conservation Advisory Commission, and I'm here to talk about um, our roadside cleanup event, which is this Saturday, the 13th. Um, so we've been, um, we've kind of fallen into a pattern on how this is organized. Mm -hmm. So starting at 9 o'clock, we will have a table set up in front of Roosters, and we will be supplying um, bright orange trash bags, um, orange um, latex gloves, 
And um, this year, for the first time, we also have safety vests um, in adult sizes and children's sizes uh, to make sure you're safe on the road um, cleaning up the trash. Um, we also significantly have cider donuts and coffee, uh, courtesy of Big Rock. That's always a, a big draw. Mm -hmm. um, so we're hoping to get a lot of um, engagement this year. It's, we have been able to um, clean up more and more um, miles of road as the years go on. Um, three years ago, we did about 18 miles, and then mm. after that, I think 36, and now last year was 40 miles, so we're, we're hoping to match or beat that record. And uh, sadly, um, with Sean's event happening um, on Saturday, um, it's Im important to know that you can clean up trash on the roadside anytime. It doesn't have to be this Saturday. But if you are planning to do that and you can't make it because of Sean's memorial or for another reason, if you could come by um, Roosters in the morning just to indicate what stre stretch of road you'll be cleaning up because we can track that and, and put it into the, the total tally. Um, also, I uh, wanted to point out that the county um, is doing their part. They are cleaning up Salt Point Turnpike on Great. April 22nd. I confirmed that today. Great. Um, so we do not have to um, send people there. Um, and we're also, we are um, noodling um, how to get folks to adopt a highway or adopt a stretch of road mm -hmm. and uh, kind of make it their own and take responsibility for it um, throughout the year. And I have to say, Ben Rathjen has been helping us um, generate ideas there and also pulling together names of folks um, who have already um, come forward to, to commit to cleaning up certain stretches of road. So we'll continue to work on that, and there'll be more on that as, as we terrific. develop that. So, Curtis, do you think there's a, um, I know we talked about this last year, but do you think there's a chance we could, as a community, do like a late summer, early fall cleanup too? Yeah, I, I, we, I guess we could try probably the later in the fall the better because then the, the growth will have died down and make it easier yeah. to get at things. And also not get so many ticks, yeah, so. And ticks, but, yes. Yeah, we can, we can certainly look into doing that. So, I mean, this, this the, the roadside cleanup day coincides, or has coincided every year with Earth Day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we did move it a week earlier, Saturday earlier this year to accommodate the, the rec park build. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say we can't do it, you know, have it twice a year and not just um, yeah. around Earth Day. Right. So. And then hopefully this whole, you know, there are, there are people that just routinely walk Hunts Lake or whatever, and mm -hmm. hopefully that will become a larger um, group of people that are just dedicated to, and the, the if you do that during the year, um, the the transfer station will accept your roadside trash obviously without a charge. You know they won't be digging in the bags, but don't put your home stuff in there. <laughs> That's always for free. Um, and uh, Ben, are you going to drive around in your truck and and collect stuff uh, like last year? I don't year? know if I'm going to be available this Saturday. I still haven't figured out whether or not I'm available. I have a list of people I've talked to Curtis about that signed up for sections of road, trying to make sure we mark all that on your map so that we don't have duplicates. Um, and I also mentioned some sections here that areas that are like particularly bad. Really anywhere if you drive around and there's no houses for a period of time is where all the garbage is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, True. I guess people who litter are respectful enough to not throw it in other people's front yards. No, actually, please, you have to wear the gloves. I had a very, <laughs> no, no, I, I won't, I won't. Or you can get one of these. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm too short for that, but um, no, it's I mean, a there's a vault for you. It's a pole vault. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You started it. It's a funny um, No, I mean, people, I, I was cleaning up across the road from my house last week, and there are some disgusting things that people decide to throw out, and you instantly pick it up and realize you just, 
Should filled be. your <laughs> your your wheelbarrow with urine. So uh, be careful with the glove thing. So come grab your donut and coffee, coffee on yeah. Saturday. Thank and you. And thank you for that. Okay, the next thing up is a proclamation. Um, we, the town is um, got a pro Grange month, is April is the uh, Grange month in the town of Stanford. And um, Eric, will you read the proclamation for us? Sure. Thank you. Whereas the Grange's mission is to strengthen individuals, families, and communities through grassroots action, service, education, advocacy, and agricultural awareness, and whereas for 156 years, the Grange has played an essential and lasting role in building rural and small town America and ensuring its resiliency through advocacy and direct service, and Whereas the Grange today is growing because it is an active, rooted, resilient, and united organization in thousands of communities across the country, mm -hmm. and whereas the Grange emphasizes civic responsibility and the involvement of citizens in the legislative process, and whereas the Grange offers opportunities for civil discussions among people of all viewpoints and opinions, serving as a safe space for exploring important social and legislative issues of the day, and whereas even though a worldwide pandemic, the Grange and our local Stanford Grange number 808 continue to promote service to the local community and volunteerism to improve the quality of life and economic well-being of its members and residents across America, and whereas the Grange is proud to be the Grange strong, rooted, resilient and united and encourages Granges and community members to come together in celebrating hometown pride and, and sustainability and whereas our local grain Stanford Grange number 808 has been active in our community since its organization in Bengal on January 23rd 1896 thus celebrating its 125th anniversary in January 2021 and whereas Stanford Grange number 808 has a history of accomplishment and service in its 128 years of existence, including the organization of the Stanford Fire Company in 1931 and sponsoring the annual Stanford Community Day since its inception in 1959. And whereas Stanford Grange number 808 continues to fill needs in our community and holds community events of interest for town residents, including Meet the Candidates Night for local, regional, and state candidates for public office, and for Board of Education candidates for the Pine Plain Central School District, school district budget meetings, a defensive driving course, fundraising penny socials for charitable causes, sponsoring a St. Pauli's textile shed for <coughs> clothing donations, helping with food insecurity through their little food pantry, and continues to sponsor the annual Stanford Community Day with 2023 as the 66th consecutive year. And whereas the 157th annual National Grange Convention in November of 2023 in Niagara Falls, Stanford Grange number 808 was recognized and honored as a distinguished Grange by the National Grange, the only Grange in New York State and east of the Mississippi River to receive this prestigious award for 14 consecutive years. Therefore, be it resolved that the town board of the town of Stanford proudly proclaims April 2024 as Grange Month, and in celebration of this, the community is invited to the Grange Month and Distinguished Grange Open House on Tuesday, April 23rd, 2024, at 7 p.m. at the Stanford Grange Hall. Proclaim this 11th day of April 2024 on the motion made by Wendy Burton and seconded by Eric Ames. Eric Ames. That's the end. Thank you. <laughs> Wendy Burton? Yes. Julie Dakota? Yes. 
Eric Ames? Yes. Nathan Virtue absent. Theodore Secor? Yes. Uh, make a motion to grant permission for the Garden Club to use the lower parking lot for their plant sale, their annual plant sale on May 11, 2024. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you. You better all come. You will. You have to come early. Yes. What time does it start? Nine. Thank you. Um, I, I make a motion to reject Bottini's bid for the Town Hall HVAC system project. Second. Um, do we need any discussion? Or do you all know what no, we, we know what the deal is? No, no, we talked about it. And I have to return that bond check. You have to them. return the bond check, right? Do I have a second? Teddy, yeah. right? Thank yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 And there, I don't need to make a motion to resubmit the bid. No, we did it already. We did it, so, okay. I make a motion to approve the minutes of March 14th. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Who wasn't here that day? Were you who was missing in March? I was. Oh, so you yeah. can't. So you'll so abstain? Was the singing bridges? <laughs> yes, we still approve. Um, and then I make a motion to approve the April abstract number four for 2024. The general fund was $47,808.53. The highway was $21,513.24. Ambulance fund monthly is $62,500. Bangal lights was $9. $101.84. The Spark Park uh, account was $151,047.38. And we spent uh, $1,760 on the HVAC system, which had to do, I think, with the engineers', the engineers walkthrough. Yeah. So, we may I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then the um, re resolution 4A of 2024, um, this comes from a request by the planning board. Be it resolved that the town board of the town of Stamford waive the applicable recreation fee for the subdivision and lot line alteration of Rocky Reef Farm LLC and Helen Watson Blodgett in the amount of $4,000 in consideration of restrictive cover covenants limiting further subdivision of the property and restricting more than 113.12 acres of the project site to open space uses. Is that second? Second. Is there any discussion? I'm going to do a roll call on this. Yeah. Wendy Burton? Yes. Julie Dakota? Yeah. Eric Ames? Yes. Nathan Virtue absent. Teddy Secor? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, does anyone else have anything for the board? Mm -mm. No. Okay, then. Um, I'll open a second privilege of the floor. I will close the second privilege <laughs> of the floor. We are going into executive session um, for litigation, so thank you all for coming. And I will be back in a second. We're going to have um, Don Smith on. Okay. Oh, do we have any students? Oh, so students? kind. One. Yes. Right here. Do you want me to fill out her form?